Hi there, welcome to IndyCar on Sunday. It is, oh, I'll let me check the date because you know what I'm like with dates. As soon as I come out in the car, I always have to check it. Okay, so it's the 22nd of August today, not far now until September. And uh, also not far until the start of the new Scottish parliamentary term. And you can't have failed to miss the newspapers in the last few days announcing the SNP and Greens uh, new political alliance, which will see for the first time uh, probably at least two, maybe more, uh, Green MSPs being given ministerial posts uh, in various departments. Now, this is a historic occasion for a lot of reasons. One being, first of all, that it gives the SNPs, the SNP and the Greens together a uh, political majority in the House of Holyrood, which means that whatever they choose to do now uh, cannot be voted down by any of the unionist parties. It also means that the Tories in particular, in fact even the Labour Party, can no longer hold uh, motions of no confidence in various members of the, uh, the Scottish Cabinet. So it clears the pathway now towards an independence referendum. And I, I don't know about you, but I was delighted to hear one of the first things announced would be that the referendum is top of the political agenda for both parties, as it's seen as an enabling political um, device, basically, uh, which enables Scotland to recover fully from the pandemic and to do so in a way which promotes a fair and green new country. Now, these fair and green new uh, new country statements are exactly what you would want to hear from a Scottish government because it's been too long uh, f fractured. The whole uh, political alliance which uh, supports independence has been split in lot into lots of different factions recently uh, after the attempt by the British state to uh, to set Alex Salmond and Nicola Sturgeon against one another. Now that is now history and that has been dealt with. The courts have found Mr Salmond not guilty and we should be able to move on towards independence now. The interesting thing I think from, uh, from my point of view now is that we are going to see a lot more green policies and one of the first ones that was announced after uh, the independence referendum was announced as a major major policy was the fact that there is a plan to invest heavily in tidal energy. This is something which I have been going on about for a long time and it's nice to see both the Greens and the SNP recognising the enormous potential of tidal energy to be the new uh, bulwark, the new mainstay of Scottish green energy production. So this is all good news. Now contrast that with what the British state is doing at the moment. Uh, there has been a, an article in the press today uh, by one of Boris Johnson's former aides talking about Boris's so-called tunnel vision, that is his idea of having a, uh, a tunnel under the Irish Sea between Scotland and uh, Northern Ireland in order to physically link up the whole of the United Kingdom so that it's all one place. Now this obviously is something which the Tories feel very strongly about because the Union is on the point of breaking up. We often hear Scotland being described as a basket case or having a poor economy and of course we all know that the only reason it has a poor economy is because it's being mismanaged by the British state at the moment. If Scotland has such a poor economy under British control, then why do they want to keep Scotland? Why is it such an asset if it's such a burden? It cannot be both at the same time. But if you look at Northern Ireland as a comparator with Scotland, it's a tiny province. It's only six counties and it has somewhere in the region of, well, I think it's about 600,000 inhabitants. And the, the majority of those now are now not in favour of keeping the Union. Now, it's it's still fairly finely balanced in Northern Ireland, but the interesting thing about it is if there was ever a dependency on the UK, it's Northern Ireland. It costs a lot more per head of population to support Britain's outpost in the six counties of Ireland than it does to support Scotland. So you have to wonder why they would waste billions and billions of pounds on a tunnel which is technically going to be extraordinarily difficult to realise. Uh, when they could simply be pumping that money into making Northern Ireland a better place to live. And I think the answer to that lies in the statement on the motivation behind why uh, the United Kingdom might want to build a tunnel based on Boris's vision. And the only reason that they can come up with is, and I'm 
paraphrasing a little bit here, but it's to show the rest of the world that Britain is still a big player and can still do big things, like putting a tunnel between the islands. Now, this, I think, uh, smacks of the kind of desperation that the United Kingdom now is showing. The fact that its union is beginning to fall apart because of Brexit is actually now showing that the British state is no longer stable anymore. As a political entity, it's destabilised itself with Brexit. Uh, it's pissed off the people in the Democratic Unionist Party who desperately want this tunnel as any kind of way of physically connecting Northern Ireland to the rest of the UK so they can say it is actually connected to the UK with some bricks and mortar. But of course a tunnel um, through the North Irish Channel which is probably somewhere between 12 and 13 miles long. Obviously, it's not as long as the Channel Tunnel, but there are severe problems with trying to put a tunnel in there, not least of which is the massive dump of ammunition, missiles, rockets, shells, um, out-of-date bombs, out-of-date warheads, not to mention all of the chemical weapons which were dumped in there over all the years that the UK uh, armed forces have been using Scotland as a bin. Now that means it's it, impossible really to tunnel under the North uh, the North Irish Channel simply because of the risk of all these unstable uh, weapons and, uh, and bombs which are lying on the seabed rusting away happily and decomposing into all sorts of unstable nasty things. So the idea apparently is to have a floating tunnel. That is basically a tube of concrete which is submerged under the water by some distance, anchored to the seabed by large cables. So it's not really a tunnel through the ground that they're proposing, it's a tunnel through the water that they're proposing, a kind of submarine tunnel with some bridges linking it as well. It's a colossal undertaking. And of course the architects and civil engineering firms would love to build something like this because it's a gigantic money spinner for them and a huge black hole for the tax money of the UK taxpayer. So I don't think it's going to happen uh, for the simple reason that it's going to cost far too much money when the government, the British government, is already hacking back all kinds of spending on all sorts of other public infrastructure. But if you contrast that with what the Scottish government, with the Greens and the SNP working together, are proposing, it's a completely different picture. What is being proposed for Scotland is not a government of chaos as the, um, the sort of rather uh, spittle-flecked comments from the Daily Express would have you believe it's not going to be a government of chaos and confusion. The chaos and confusion is happening in the rest of the UK with Brexit. Uh, to actually characterise a government which plans a new green economy, something which is going to revitalise the entire country and create thousands, tens of thousands of new jobs as being chaos and confusion is utter rubbish. So uh, I think Everything in the UK at the moment is falling to bits and they're beginning to panic and it's getting desperate and the newspaper headlines are getting more and more shrill and more and more outrageous and extreme as time goes on. But it's interesting that the SNP has said, and the Greens of course with them, have said that there will be an independence referendum regardless of anything that Boris Johnson says in London and anything that his government says to the contrary, and it will be in the first part of this parliamentary session at Holyrood. Now that means it has to be before the end of 2022. Now it's interesting that it's a kind of two-year lead time because it's virtually identical to the lead-in time for the referendum in 2014, and I'm wondering actually whether the, the new independence campaign which is going to be launched is going to be a two-year campaign simply because of the, the relatively low state in terms of finances that the entire independence campaign finds itself in. We know that the money which was set aside for the uh, independence referendum campaign has had to go on other things because the SNP has published figures to that effect. So new money will have to be raised and uh, with the Greens and the SNP working together, I think that's quite a realistic prospect. But it does mean we're building from a lower base this time. So everybody's going to have to work extremely hard, not only with the campaigning, but to raise the money to do the leafleting and the stalls and all the other things which physical campaigning de determined that we have to do. But it's not impossible. It's going to be hard work. 
But on the other hand, everything is working in our favour at the moment. The chaos and confusion in the rest of the United Kingdom is driving people towards independence at a furious rate. And once the, uh, uh, the, the latest grace period for European imports ends, then the United Kingdom's border force is going to have to start checking everything coming into the UK via Europe. And all the uh, certifications are going to have to be complete. All the taxation will have to be done, all the documents filled out. And of course, that will slow things down still further. And with the lack of uh, enough uh, shall we say, indigenous or homegrown truck drivers to do the delivery work, there will be shortages. And the Food and Drinks Federation, the uh, Retailers Associations, the Road Haulage Association, many other organisations are warning the British government that we are heading into a winter of shortages. Now, <laughs> this all goes to show you that the chaos is not on this side of the border. The chaos is in England and Wales because it is in England and Wales that Brexit has really uh, been the, uh, the chosen will of the people at the time when they voted in 2016. They may have changed their minds somewhat since then, but the fact of the matter is we are stuck with Brexit, all of us. And uh, Scotland is probably uniquely placed in the United Kingdom as the only nation which is actually able to extricate itself from the mess that uh, the Tories have got the country into. So what is needed now from the, the Scottish government, including the Greens and the, the SNP, is a clear, not a roadmap, but a, a gigantic national project to change the entire economic system of Scotland and to change the entire direction of, of its industrial output away from dirty coal burning, oil burning, gas burning, towards a, a future where we develop only natural resources which are renewable, things like wind. Now you may also have noticed this, uh, this very day in fact that the Unionist papers are screaming that there is outrage apparently in Scotland at the, uh, the new administration in Holyrood announcing that there will be new uh, mainland wind farms being okayed and how terrible all this is and you know what a disaster it is. Now you have to contrast that with uh, the climate emergency because there is an emergency it's upon us now we've seen the results of dramatic and violent weather already this year on our own doorsteps so this is going to become normal now and it's going to get worse the scottish government needs to have more wind farms it needs to develop the tidal energy as tidal energy develops onshore wind farms will be able to be decommissioned and removed without leaving the massive blot on the landscape that things like coal mines or uh, nuclear power stations or gas-fired power stations might have done in the past. These are things which can simply be dismantled and placed elsewhere. So they don't leave a scar on the landscape and they may only be temporary. But there has to be, uh, as I say, a national project announced by the new administration on the same kind of scale as the American moonshot in 1969. We're looking at mobilizing the entire country towards a new future and that's what the independence referendum needs to be about it needs to be about an all-inclusive new country which is fairer to people which doesn't leave people behind in which there is a, a national um, basic income available to everyone so nobody needs to suffer in poverty anymore and the benefits will not be necessary anymore because with a universal basic income nobody is left out there are no preconditions to it it is just based on the level of your income and the way that you live your life need not be subsistence the other thing that we can do is design this new um, industrial revolution to include a lot more automation so that the jobs which do exist are high value, highly paid jobs. We'll remove a lot of the uh, staff from North Sea uh, engineering to subsea engineering in the tidal energy uh, industries. Now it's not, it's not going to be the same as it was before because uh, mass employment in factories and things like that 
are not going to be part of this future. There will be lots of smaller workplaces, hundreds, thousands of them, producing things locally, because the more you produce locally, the less transport there is involved in getting them to your customers, and therefore the less carbon is emitted. So spreading the workforce out around the country in local communities is what needs to happen. The fact that there are not so many, shall we say, lower skilled jobs means that there will be new opportunities, that there has to be new opportunities for people to learn high skilled jobs. And I'm not talking about high tech here, I'm talking about craft skills, about manufacturing high quality uh, items, furniture, all kinds of things, clothing, you name it which have a high value and will last a long, long time because the longer these things last, the fewer of them you need to buy and the less there is thrown into waste. We need a massive recycling centre based in central Scotland which is capable of recycling all of the plastic waste that we currently have and turning it into valuable chemicals which we can sell to other countries. All of these things need a massive program and that is what I would like to see happen with the Greens and the SNP. It's not going to happen very fast. It has to happen in stages and there has to be a switch over from, shall we say, the dirty industries, the dirty hot industries to these lower energy, greener industries. There will always be a need, incidentally, for things like aluminium smelting and that can be done, as we know, using renewable energy from hydroelectric power. And it's been done for many years in Scotland. There's no reason why it can't be expanded. Uh, and scrap aluminium from all kinds of devices uh, and machines can easily be recycled using that system. We have the facilities to do that already and it costs nothing in terms of carbon emissions to do that. So there will be hot processes involved, but they will no longer be gas fired, coal fired or, um, or using carbon in any way. It's not going to be necessary. There will be a need to develop a new fleet of um, commercial shipping to take Scotland's goods abroad because we do not want them travelling down roads and motorways by truck through the Channel Tunnel. Given the chaos which is going to continue in England and Wales with Brexit, we need a new way of trading. That means opening up our ports, that means revitalising all our major seaports and opening them up for trade. So there's a massive amount of investment needing to be found and that can be found on international markets but only if the Scottish Government has its own currency and has its own central bank and is able to borrow foreign currency, dollars or euros which have a good value uh, and is able from the output of these new industries to repay those loans easily and it can do that because we are already uh, virtually 100% uh, powered as far as electricity is concerned by renewables and I would anticipate that by the end of this century we will be producing at least another 100% more energy than that which we can export and that is a basically a cash crop if you like that we can constantly sell and use as income. So there are a lot of things here which I can see the Greens and the SNP working together to develop, changing the uh, the taxation rules for things like petroleum. Uh, oil is actually the fly in the ointment of a green new economy because it's it's embarrassing to have a huge lake of oil right next to you which actually belongs to you because it's inside your territorial boundaries. We need to think what to do with that oil and I've mentioned before that one of the caveats that we could make with oil companies is that oil if it's brought ashore from the North Sea fields which are currently licensed, if it comes ashore in Scotland, it must only uh, be reduced to usable chemicals and not turned into fuel. Now this is a perhaps a, a, a chemistry problem for the industry to solve, to see if that can be done. I believe that it can be done. It's also possible for us to reduce plastic waste back into hydrocarbons to be re-refined back into chemicals. So there are there are ways of doing this, but need big investment. However, all of these things, if we make these big investments, will generate phenomenal amounts of both energy, jobs, and new industries, all of which can propel the country forwards out of the chaos which has been caused by Brexit and the lack of investment in Scotland's industries for decades and the over-reliance on oil revenues by the United Kingdom to prop up its economy. We won't need the oil revenues in the same way 
but we can still benefit from oil, as I've said, by not burning it, but by simply taking the chemicals we need from it and either returning what's left of the hydrocarbons back underground and pumping them back into the existing wells, which, let's face it, are just being filled up with slurry and mud anyway, and keeping that, that methane and those hydrocarbons buried under the sea means they can't get into the atmosphere. So much to do, so little time. A two-year lead-in will give us the time we need to develop all of these concepts and all of these ideas into something concrete, but it's going to take a massive uh, collective push by everybody in the country to make this work. I don't think it's going to be a hard sell. There will always be those NIMBYs and diehards who will never accept any change at all. But they will be in the minority. They are the Tory voters of this world. They are the ones who are wedded to the past, who don't want anything to change. And let's face it, that is the definition of the word conservative. They don't want change. They want everything to stay exactly the same as it is because they're quite happy making money out of it. The rest of us, unfortunately, have been left to suffer for this. And that, I think, is what needs to change. So I guess what I'm saying here is that the tunnel between Scotland and Northern Ireland will never be built because the United Kingdom can't afford it. And it would probably much rather uh, re-equip its armed forces and go and fight some other war somewhere else. It's obviously very embarrassed at being uh, caught on the hoof, or, or not caught on the hoof, but caught off guard by the sudden arrival of the Taliban in Kabul when they thought they had weeks left in which to get uh, the people who had worked for the, the British military and people who had worked for the American military to get them to safety quickly. The Taliban actually, uh, I, I noticed from an interview, were a little bit embarrassed because they said, and I'm just quoting what they've said, that uh, their intention was to stay outside of Kabul uh, and not enter it and just simply negotiate a new, uh, a new share, you know, a new transition to a new authority. But unfortunately, all of the coalition forces and the Afghan army deserted their posts, leaving Kabul without security. And the, uh, the Taliban are saying basically that they had to come in and man these security uh, points in order to maintain law and order. Now, I, I take what the Taliban say with a big pinch of salt. But it did mean that um, there was no protection for these civilians who are trying to escape. And that is a huge embarrassment for the UK as well as the United States. And I hope it's a lesson to them, perhaps, to stay out of other people's countries. Yes, they got bin Laden. Yes, they stopped um, al-Qaeda from developing training uh, camps in Afghanistan. And that was a success. But we really shouldn't have stayed as long as we did. However, it's time to move on, and Scotland has a two-year clock ticking now. I think the starting gun has been fired. Nicholas Thurgeon has announced there will be a referendum before 2022. It gives us at least uh, a rough idea of the outer marker, if you like, for when this referendum will be held. Personally, I think the referendum will be held later rather than sooner, because there is a lot of work to be done. Uh, and now that the, the fog of COVID is finally lifting, the Scottish Government, as well as doing its day job of governing the country, will be able to develop these policies and push forward with this new independence referendum as soon as they get back into Parliament. And I would expect to see the, uh, the independence referendum bill, which is currently hanging fire, being presented formally to Holyrood um, on their return, being debated and passed so that we can move quickly to a referendum date. Anyway, all is, uh, is changing. This is a turning point now, and I think we need to be optimistic, but we also need to recognise the sheer amount of hard work that's going to be necessary to make this happen. So I'm uh, realistic about that. Although I would prefer to have the referendum next year, I don't know if it will be enough time to develop all of these policies into something which is doable in uh, inside the term of a new parliament after independence. But we need something, and we need to start somewhere. And now appears to be the time when we start. We won't know the date until the um, independence referendum bill has been debated, amended, and passed. But as soon as that happens, we will have a date. And it could be that the date will be announced before COP26, because that timeline between now uh, and 
what is going to be the start of the parliamentary term is roughly about six weeks. And that could be enough time for the independence referendum bill to be turned into an act and for it to produce a date, a question and a franchise that can be announced just before COP26 at the point where it will do the maximum amount of damage to the British government, which is going to be trying desperately to look green, even though it isn't very green. Anyway, that's about it for me today. These are uh, changing times and finally things are starting to move. But as I say, a lot of work ahead of us. So we need to knuckle down, stop arguing with each other and start fighting to convince people that now is the time to move out of the chaos and confusion of Brexit to a better future, which we have constructed ourselves by our own hard work and sheer thought and innovation rather than relying on past dirty industries and hoping that the British state will muddle through. It's not going to muddle through this time. It's basically destroyed itself with Brexit and there's nothing that they can do to change that. But we now have the opportunity to leave the chaos and the confusion behind. And I think we should grab it. See you soon. Bye bye.